Nothing I'm going to say will live up to that. Stop it. Oh, man. Thank you. Thank you, Seattle. God. Wow. Oh, man. Oh. So I'm very uh, happy to be here. Not as lucid as I would like to be, but I'm very happy. I, you know, I wish someone, two things, really quick. Uh, when, you be, when you become a new dad, they don't tell you about the constant hallucinating that you do. I just hallucinate, that's all I do, because I'm on two hours sleep all the time. I wouldn't have wasted all that time in the 90s gobbling all the LSD and mushrooms that I did. All I, all I had to do was get two hours sleep a night, and you walk around, every light has a tracer, and <laughs> I, can, I can taste colors. It's just nonstop. Oh, and also, um, I want to apologize to anybody that I ever made fun of for wearing sweatpants in public. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was wrong. You were right. They're a miracle. They're a miracle. I thought, I thought that the, the pinnacle of mankind would be Mars colony or teleportation. Nope. Sweatpants. That was it. Sweatpants. We started with fire and the wheel and writing, agriculture, penicillin, sweatpants, everything else, we're just on the downward slope. We did it. We're all done. And if you, if you see somebody in sweatpants in public, they stink. They smell horrible. Nobody, nobody takes a shower, shampoos, shaves, brushes their teeth, and then puts sweatpants. At that point, they just go, oh, well, I may as well get dressed if I did all that. Why would I? Every, sweatpants are always pulled on over undeodorized flesh. It's just, it's all swamp ass and nut fog down here. It's just, a, it's an unbroken belt of stink. That's all it is. You can cut slices like a bunt cake and throw it at an attacker. Just, oh, hot mayonnaise. I was driving around one day. I was doing my daddy errands. I had my sweatpants on. And I'm in my car, and I was thinking, you know, my wife's been cooped up all day. I bet she wants some magazines, you know, to read. So I pull up to this newsstand. I don't put any money in the meter. I pull up, I jump out, grab a lot of magazines. I turn around. There's a guy about to write a ticket on my car. And usually, well, usually when you talk your way out of a ticket, you try to add a little drama and poetry. You ramp up a little bit, make it sound real. No, all, I'm in blurt mode. All I can do, I've got a fourth of a brain cell firing. I can form the beginning of a thought, and then it falls out of my skull. That's the best I can do. So I walk up. Here's my attempt to talk my way out of a ticket. Ready? Please don't put a ticket on my car. There it is. There's my shot. I, I may as well have just walked up and went, don't want this. That, that would have been just as effective as what I said. No. So the, the guy, he looks at me, and for half a second, he's terrified. Not, I'm not a scary guy. I should have mentioned, I was wearing, I was wearing sweatpants and a t-shirt, and they were the same color. So I, I don't, I, I didn't even look like a Dr. Seuss drawing. I looked like a Dr. Seuss rough sketch that he did where he's at a bar one night, some young girl's icing him out. He's like, give me a napkin, God damn it. I'll show you who you're talking to. Yeah, yeah, see? I made your childhood magical! <laughs> yeah, Dr. Seuss on an angry pussy hunt. Strap in. <laughs> so... <laughs> so he... He's terrified for half a second, then he's furious. The way that, I don't know if anyone here has ever been frightened by a moth. 
He gets frightened by a spider or a hornet. You go, that scared the crap out of me. That was a spider. A moth scares you. Your reaction is, oh, God. Oh, that thing is going to die. There's no way. I'm not reaching the end of my life. I didn't take care of a moth. No way. So now he's got to kill the moth and regain his manhood. And he screams at me, why did you put any money in these meters? And I said, because I thought I could buy. I'm shaking a bag of magazines at him now. I, th I thought I could buy my magazines and drive away before you showed up. And he says, get in your car and get out of here. And I go, thank you. And then I get, I get in my car. I'm about to drive away. And he leans into my window and says, let me explain something to you. We don't have time to pull over and check every one of these meters. You understand? And I go, yeah, I'm sorry, man. And it took me three blocks before it hit me. That's all you have time to do. <laughs> That's your, you just described your job. It doesn't say parking enforcement and homicide on the side of the car. It's like you're... I got three ax murders in El Monte. I gotta check all these meters. There's a maniac on the loose. I want my daughter to grow up smart, but now I don't know how smart I wanted to be, there, there just seems to be a connection to me, and maybe I'm wrong about this, I haven't really read any statistics, but there does seem to be a connection between really smart, really young, and then crazy later on. There just seems, like, my brother-in-law babysits these two kids in Chicago, and they're, they're two years old, and they're prodigies. They're, they're, their mom is a physicist, and the dad plays multiple instruments in an orchestra, and the kids are brilliant. They're, they're two years old, they speak languages, they do advanced math, they play instruments, they're prodigies. They're in diapers, they're in diapers, and they do all that stuff. So, one time, my brother-in-law's babysitting, and one of the kids had an accident <laughs> in his diapers. So my brother-in-law said, oh, do I gotta change your diapers? And the little kid said, diaper. <laughs> Singular. Yes, that's really smart. That's also the confidence of a serial killer. If you, if you are shitting your pants and then correcting people's grammar, that's, you're just neck deep in the crazy pool, aren't you? It's like the, what? No, I didn't shit my pants. It happened eight seconds ago. I shat my pants. Read a book, you lepton. <laughs> then my parents come by, visit the new baby. And look, the main reason that they're there is to visit and see their grandchild. That's the main reason. But they're also there to defend how they raised me. That's one of the other things on the agenda. And by the way, your parents loved you, and they completely screwed up. They loved you, they had horrible information, they did the best they could, they screwed everything up. I'm screwing everything up, I'm sure I'll find out in 40 years, but I'm reading the latest books and I'm sure they're all wrong. I'm trying. So my mom visits and the baby needs a nap. Put the baby in her bassinet and my mom said, oh, uh, you put her on her back. I was like, yeah, there's a thing now. It's called back to sleep, put them on their back, it prevents crib death. My mom said, you and your brother slept face down every night, you turned out fine. I let that go. <laughs> I don't have four hours. <laughs> then the baby woke up, I gave her a bottle. My mom said, you fed her like two hours ago. I was like, yes, at, at this stage, they need calories. They, they, need, they need to eat that much. They need the calories. And my mom said, you used to scream all night we didn't feed you, you turned out fine. <laughs> At that point, I wanted to say, I didn't turn out fine. I'm a fat comedian with OCD. I get up in front of strangers and talk about my dick. This is not good parenting. He's like, ah, is that really? Is that what he does? Hmm. I don't know. 
Look, I know that the bellwether for bad parenting is the stripper, but I put it to you, a comedian is way worse than a stripper. <laughs> stripper goes on stage, shows you her tits and her pussy, and you give her money as well you should. <laughs> that is a warm, neighborly thing to do. <laughs> comedian goes on stage, keeps his clothes on, talks about his genitals. How crazy would you think a stripper was if she came out and did that? Came out fully clothed. Guys, let me tell you about my vagina for the duration of this REO Speedwagon song. You're definitely gonna wanna, you're gonna wanna hear all about this. Get your dollar bills out, this is well worth your time. Like, wow, her dad must have fucked her in a Garfield mask. That is not, whew, that is not good. Yeah, fucking the daughter in a Garfield mask. Yeah! <laughs> you, ever do, you ever do that when you're bored, like you jock rock your life in your head when, it's, when stuff is so boring you can't believe it? That's what I do all day now. Standing in line at the post office, gonna buy some commemorative stamps, yeah! Eating the sleeve of saltines in my underwear, watching Carlito's way. Come on, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Jerking off to internet porn in my office when I should teach my daughter to read, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's why I hope that if the FBI or the CIA, I just hope they never bug my car. Bug my, put a microphone in my house, my office, I don't care. Don't bug my car. When I'm driving alone, the stuff that comes out of my head when I'm bored my car. If my car has ever been bugged, they've never taken that microphone out. I am the CIA's Christmas party every year. Where they're like, we have another Oswald, here we go. Just hours of me just sitting there going, I said to, to There's a lot of Mexicans out today. I learned a Mexican in my way. I like tacos. Oh, I got the cutest little puppy in the world. Yes, I do. He's a little sweetie and he's waiting at home. And he's got a bed and playing with a boat. Send an APB to the Burbank cops. There's a thief made of cinnamon and lemon drops. He's covered in fur from his nose to his feet. He's a crazy kid, a man of Lincoln Street. <laughs> All day, alone in my car. It's pathetic. Pathetic! Guys, make the eggnog. We got another hour of Oswald. He sings all of Abba Gold on this one, it's horrifying. <laughs> and Seeger's playing on the radio, he sings over it, it's insane. <laughs> I got offered to go uh, audition for a romantic comedy and they wanted me to audition for the part of the gay best friend, which... <laughs> It's 2011. It's 2011. I may as well put on blackface and tap dance. That is how, that's how old that cliche is now. And I read the script and every scene, it was every standard gay best friend. Like I walk in and she's crying and I go, oh, microwave popcorn and red wine stat. So, pointless. Now, I have a lot of gay friends and a lot of my gay friends are idiots just like my straight friends. But in every movie, all gay characters are these magical, intelligent quip machines 
which, if you're gay, has got to feel really dehumanizing after a while. So I said, look, I will audition if, and then they heard my conditions and went, you're not doing this. <laughs> I went, if I get the part, I want to play the guy really dumb. I want to be the first dumb gay best friend <laughs> in the history of cinema. Like, I'll keep, and I'll keep all the gay best friend rhythms. I just don't want to have anything helpful or intelligent to say. <laughs> so every scene, I would just walk in and like, I've seen that look before, sweetie. You, you want to... Um, <laughs> just do... A, something with his cock, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Fuck, I'm tired. <laughs> you and your two friends, when the three of you get together, you guys are like the... <laughs> what? Who are the guys with the muskets? What did they call those guys again? <laughs> are they called musketeers? Was I that close? And I, I could not tell you the title of this movie if you put a gun to my face. It was, every romantic comedy should just be called Trying to Fuck. <laughs> this week. <laughs> this week, Jennifer Aniston and this guy are gonna try to fuck. <laughs> Next week, Jennifer Aniston and another guy are gonna try to fuck. Will they fuck? Probably. <laughs> From the writer of Nyeh and the director of Nyeh comes <laughs> Why did Why do they make trailers for Jennifer Aniston movies? They make, they always make a set amount of money. What do they care? I would actually, I would, I would actually go see a Jennifer Aniston movie if she did a trailer, and the whole trailer is one minute of a monkey shitting. That's the whole trailer. That's all it is. There's just, it just says, this Christmas, Jennifer Aniston, and then there's a monkey in a Napoleon hat, and he's just, for one minute, nonstop, just And not even like, not even like healthy turds either. That weird, like, intermittent diarrhea spray, like it clearly, like, it clearly hurts, like the monkey's angry about it. So just like this, pff, ah, pff, ah, like, it, like, like the monkey wants to punch his own ass. He's angry at his own ass for shitting the way it's shitting. So this, pff, ah. Jennifer Aniston. Like, wow, we should go see that. That's, my God, what is that about? That's awesome. There better be more than one minute of that monkey shitting, though. That, that monkey better shit for five minutes. They better not have just shown me the best part of the movie. <laughs> like, there we go, there we go. We gotta put the sizzle reel out there. Hook the people in. Where's the angry monkey shit? Oh. You know, people that are against gay marriage, if they just openly said, I'm against gay marriage because thinking about two men having butt sex or two women having scissor sex <laughs> kills my boner, dries up my vagina, I can't have sex, it ruins my life, that's why I'm against it. That would be a valid argument. We'd have to actually debate you on that. <laughs> but these lunatics always go, well, because it says in the Bible. Okay, stop, hang on. I'm glad you like a book. I really am. I'm glad, hey, I'm glad that... <laughs> At this point, I'm glad anybody's reading anything. And I'm not even putting it in the Bible. The Bible is terrific. Give it a read. It's got monsters and adventures. And, and hey, if you like torture porn, check out the Old Testament. Oh, man. Any Saw fans out there? Woo! Get the Old Testament. 
But just because you like something in a book doesn't mean you can have the thing you like in the book happen in real life. That's what crazy people want. I can't go to the White House with a bunch of Green Lantern comics and go, I want a Green Lantern ring. I saw it in a book I like. Make the thing in the book I like be here now. I would be justifiably tased if I did that. <laughs> Nobody would go, hey, we have to respect his beliefs. <laughs> you know, you gotta, you've got to respect everybody's beliefs. No, you don't. <laughs> That's what gets us in trouble. You have to, look, you have to acknowledge everyone's beliefs. And then you have to reserve the right to go, that is fucking stupid. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I acknowledge you believe that. That's great, but I'm not going to respect it. I have an uncle who believes he saw Sasquatch. We do not believe him, nor do we respect him. <laughs> what if I, what if I 1,000% believed, and I believe this 1,000%, what if I believed that there was a giant, invisible anus <laughs> hovering over me, and if I wasn't nice and helpful and courteous and charitable to everyone I met, the anus would appear suck me up into it, and I would be devoured by shit piranhas. <laughs> and I mean, and I believe this a thousand percent. I would be the nicest guy you ever met. You'd be like, Patton, you're so helpful and charitable and, and courteous to people. Why is that? And I'd go, it's funny you should ask me that. <laughs> you can't see it, but there's an invisible anus hovering over me. And if I'm not nice to everybody, it will appear and suck me up, and I'll be eaten. Well, I don't need to tell you about the shit piranhas. We all know about those, right? <laughs> Your correct response would be, I acknowledge you believe that. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Please do not stop believing in the dumbest thing I've ever heard because you're actually helping people out with your craziness. Don't stop believing in that stuff. Please, I beg you. <laughs> I mean, just... Jesus' superpowers alone are so crazy. They, they don't even, look, I'm not saying that they're bad. They're just so random. He has the most random, like on the one hand, he's got the necromancer powers where he could drive away demons and raise the dead. Oh, wow, awesome. And then over here, he can take a little bit of food and make it into a lot of food. What? <laughs> Doesn't that sound like a, like a power that one of his sidekicks had in earlier versions of the Bible? And then as they kept rewriting it, they're like, why don't we lose Sandwich Joe? Why do we have him? Is he? He doesn't really say anything cool. Like, Jesus is always saying all this cool shit, and then he pops in, who wants a nice pita, huh? It's the fucking Sermon on the Mount, Joe. Get out of here. They looked hungry. I thought I'd pop in. And, oh, Give Jesus the lunch powers. <laughs> See, that's and that it's Jesus' wisdom and humility that would keep him out of the good superhero team. Because if he ever came back, he wouldn't just go to the X-Men and say, guys, I can raise the dead. <laughs> so you keep me at the mansion. Someone dies, bring him back. Boom. I put him right back in the game. They'd be like, wow, you're hired. Thanks, Jesus. Let's go get you a cool leather uniform, man. Are you married to the beard? All right, no, that's cool. Um, he, would be, he would be very humble and self-effacing and say, well, superpowers, let me think. Well, there was this one time when many people were gathered and there was but a crust of bread and a few fish and then... The next thing you know, everyone had a nice lunch. <laughs> and they'd say, wow, that's amazing. Hang on, just one second. Guys, remember when we took down Magneto and we needed like 15,000 sandwiches? <laughs> yeah, me neither. So uh, we're good. Thank you for coming in. Um, I don't know what to tell you. Try the Avengers. They'll take anybody, those guys. Have you been to them? Oh, they have a, hey, they have a guy with a bow and arrow. I'm not kidding. They, 
What are they recruiting at sporting goods stores or? <laughs> hey, you jump rope really fast. How'd you like to be an Avenger? <laughs> I like the way you tether balls, sir. <laughs> How would you like to take on Ultron? <laughs> so, <laughs> I was taking this flight from Vegas to Burbank. It's a 40 minute flight on Southwest. I take it a lot. And uh, the flight is a rock polisher. It's all turbulence. It's terrifying. <laughs> and one day we're taking the flight and we're landing. Seats up, seatbelt song, can't get up. And a guy next to me started doing something. And when he began doing it, I realized I've never seen this done. He used a vomit bag. Because usually on a plane, you've got to throw up. You're like, oh, I'm throw up. And you go use the bathroom. We're landing. He can't get up. And I realized as he started doing it, he must throw up every flight. Because this guy was the Zorro of vomit bag users. <laughs> he was amazing. He was sitting there. He had a magazine on this leg, and he's reading it. And you see it hit him. It's, oh, oh. And he never looked up from the magazine. He reached up with one hand. Grabbed the vomit bag, snapped it open with one hand. Whap. Fitted it over his mouth, made a soundproof seal. <laughs> then started violently throwing up, but it sounded like this. Finished, took it away from his mouth, wiped his lips as he did it. Oh, amazing. Sealed the little metal tabs, folded them with one hand. I'm sitting here, he's holding up here. He transfers it to this hand, very polite, very polite away from me, and just held it up for the rest of the flight till we landed. And he filled that bag. Like he, he I mean, he could have stopped a mugging with that thing. It was a, it was a brick in a purse, like, and I, I was just like, I was watching him and I just kept thinking, what a horrible thing to be great at. <laughs> like, that's his thing. Some guy like, hey, look, I know I'm getting old, I'm not the best looking guy, but some girl sees me shoot pool, you know, that's my window. That's, you know, I'm a good pool, pool player. And this other guy, ah, I'm losing my hair, I'm fat, all right. But some girl sees me play bass guitar, boom. I got a shot. I'm a great, great guitar player. And this guy, I still get out in the bars, you know. Girlies keep getting younger, I'm getting older. It's not happening some nights. It's when I bring out old pukey. <laughs> oh boy, I've had this bad boy. Oh, I, mean, I would say since Predator 2 came out, if I had to put a date on it. But uh, bring this thing out. Play it like Dizzy Gillespie, boy. That <laughs> old pukey's put a lot of backs on mattresses. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> put a lot of backs on mattresses. Me and pukey, Butch and Sundance, huh? Going out. To... <laughs> no, I thought he was vomiting. <laughs> Madam, I I know you find me physically repulsive, and if if you were to walk away and never look back, I would never blame you. But please. One last time, let me vomit for you. <laughs> let me buy an egg salad sandwich from this 7-Eleven. <laughs> Leave it on the dashboard of this car in this hot parking lot. <laughs> Wolf it down four hours later, don a fur coat and do squat thrust on the punishing asphalt. And only after I've sent the contents of my stomach rocketing into this bag, if you can look at me and feel no love, you may leave the island of Cordoba. Please let me vomit for you. I'm so <laughs> I was out shopping, grocery shopping. I'm in my sweatpants. I'm in my matching color T-shirt. 
and flip-flops, ladies. <laughs> so, <laughs> got my crumbled up shopping list and I'm staggering around. What the hell I gotta buy? <laughs> and our supermarket has a deli counter where you can walk up and they'll cut you up a pound of ham, turkey, cheese, anything you want, cut it up fresh, boom, off you go. But then to save everybody time, they will pre-cut one pound things of ham, turkey, cheese, so you can walk up and go, I'll get two cheeses, I'll get a ham, and boom, you're on your way. So I'm staggering up to the counter with my list, and I vaguely see that the next guy in line is this morbidly obese guy, huge, and he's the next guy in line at the counter, and he's blocking part of the counter, and what I can't see is there's only one one pound thing of pre-cut ham in the ham bin, there's only one left. I can't see that. All I hear as I approach him is him say, I want all the ham. <laughs> That's all I heard. <laughs> Meaning he just wants that one thing. But to, I immediately ran away <laughs> around the corner into the next aisle and started laughing my ass off. Not, I wasn't even laughing at him. I was thinking of the guy at the deli counters going, gulp, here we go. And then like, Eye of the Tiger starts up, like he's doing it. It's happening. <laughs> then I thought, what if a third party witnessed that? What if a third person was 20 yards away and all they see is a guy dressed like me with a crumpled piece of paper. And he's approaching this morbidly obese guy at a deli counter. And just as he gets there, the morbidly obese guy goes, I want all the ham. And the guy with the paper goes, oh shit, and he runs away. He might, he might honestly believe that he just saw the future get doomed. Because obviously, the morbidly obese guy is destined to begin working out and become this cut, muscular warrior of the wasteland and save humanity from the robot lizards that have taken over in 40 years. And the few remaining humans have sent me, this emissary, back to read him the message and tell him of his destiny. But we have historical records. We know we have to get to him before he decides to commit ham suicide at the pavilions in Burbank, California. And I'm clearly woozy from the time tunnel, and I'm trying to get to him, and I'm almost there when he says, I want all the ham. Like, oh God, we're doomed! We need to find another warrior! I was in uh, Minneapolis and I was talking to somebody and they, they lived in a nearby town where not only is there the factory that makes Spam, I think it's the Hormel factory? But ne next to the factory itself is the official Spam Museum. <laughs> the Museum of the History of Spam. And when I heard that, I actually got kind of depressed because it hit me, the only people who have ever visited the Spam Museum, hipster douchebags, and that's it. <laughs> Those are the only people that have ever gone there. Guys, and they're all out front, like, look at Spam Museum, get it? And getting their Christmas card photo taken, and like, uh. The poor people at that museum, I almost feel like it's my mission. I wanna buy, like, a pair, uh, I wanna go to JCPenney, get a pair of tan chinos, and a dorky short sleeve shirt, and be their first non-ironic visitor. <laughs> Be their first sincere visitor where I just show up and go, I enjoy the Spam meat product and I would love to hear its history and visit your museum. <laughs> I've never heard of Monty Python. They would carry me around like Peter Gabriel. They would not know what to do with me. Like, oh my God, somebody who's not wearing a fucking Arcade Fire shirt. This is awesome. <laughs> I don't know what to do with this guy. their first non-ironic visitor. 
that I'd leave and go, thank you very much. I have to go visit the Pabst Blue Ribbon Brewery and be the first guy that doesn't have mutton shops posing out front. We're gonna have to dub me saying brewery and not bewery. Did you fucking hear that? <laughs> Gotta go visit the bewery. <laughs> you know where they bew the beers? <laughs> yeah, that's where they bew the beers. They gotta go see them bew them. Gotta lose some goddamn weight once and for all. I'll never do it, but I'm gonna, every, every album I do now, from now on, it's gonna go, I gotta lose some weight, man. I gotta, <laughs> 10 albums from now, I'm gonna come out here on a rascal scooter. <laughs> I gotta lose some weight. <laughs> this time I'm gonna do it. I knew I had, I, I know I gotta do something because my, my two-year-old daughter loves to do these little dance parties where I'll play music all through the house. And it's not like that kiddie stuff either. It's whatever I'm listening to. She loves it. Pixies and Beatles. Doesn't matter. And she'll dance. She likes it. We does a little dance. And I'll go, yeah, dance party. And we'll start dancing. And she's a rocket. She can just dance forever. And, and I'm good for 90 seconds. I'll be like, <laughs> yeah. And then I got to go, just keep dancing. There you go. And I'll, I'll lean against the wall. <laughs> it's almost like, I don't know if anyone remembers when Axl Rose came out on the VMAs a few years ago for the <laughs> Guns N' Roses reunion. And Axl Rose was a slinky, you know, serpenty rock god. And then after kind of kicking everyone out of the band, he sort of gained the equivalent of Duff McKagan. Like he kind of, <laughs> he basically put on one of his other band members in weight equivalent. And he made the mistake, like they had like, his microphone was out in the middle of the stage, but he made the mistake of running from the edge of the stage all the way out to the center mic to start singing Welcome to the Jungle, remember that? And he ran way too fast. And he basically did, he did like what I would do if I was doing, he comes running out going like, yeah, I got some roses. He's like, welcome to the jungle. That's a fuck. <laughs> but then I'll take my daughter to these like we go to this music together class in this place called Wallaby where she plays and they'll, they'll play music and the kids will dance and my daughter will dance hard for like 90 seconds like yay and then she'll go and lean against the wall like <laughs> Not winded, she just thinks that's what dancing is. Dancing is, you go like this, and then you go. <laughs> I'm dancing like, no, sweetie, that's, uh. You can probably keep dancing. You're, <laughs> you're not sweating all of a sudden. And I bet your left arm doesn't hurt. And I bet you don't smell burnt toast. But the problem is, it's just the goddamn meetings to go lose weight. I was in Weight Watchers for a while. I went to Weight Watchers, and it's a great organization. But you know what? Carbs and sugar doesn't have a William S. Burroughs or a Keith Richards. We don't have all my, all my alcoholic, drug addict friends. Their meetings are awesome and dark and compelling. <laughs> yeah, I, I T-boned a school bus, and I had to flee to Mexico. And then that's when I, like, wow. And all the Weight Watchers meetings were, well, number one, I had Doritos for breakfast again. And, uh, but I decided to forgive myself and I put it in my points counter. And then I went to a friend's pool party and I said, damn it, I'm gonna swim. And I got in the pool and it doesn't matter how I look. And I was very cool with myself, but they had pie. And I realized I subconsciously cut a huge slice of pie and left it beside the pool so I could swim up to it and take a bite every now and then. And I said, hey, I'm swimming towards pie. <laughs> A 
And hearing myself say that stuff really was like, I can't do this. This is horrible. I need, I need one, there's gotta be one dark, creepy, Hubert Selby Jr. weight loss story. I was like, yeah, I was, I was living with this obese 13-year-old prostitute down in Juarez, and we ripped off a drugstore and used the money to buy nine boxes of hard pretzels. Uts, not that Snyder shit for squares. And we binged out for about five days, and on the sixth morning, I woke up, she was gone. That she'd stolen that stash of Ritz crackers I'd hid in the mattress. And that's when I looked in the mirror and told myself, it's time to start swimming away from pie. <laughs> time to start swimming away from pie. The circus is in town. You know, we've gotten rid of slavery, child labor. How in the hell do we still have the circus? Honestly, the circus, which, look, I'm sure, I don't know when they invented the circus in 1 AD. I'm sure back then, when there was nothing else to do except be afraid of the sun, yeah, the circus was great. But imagine, imagine pitching the circus now as an entertainment destination. Hey, I got this great idea for families and kids. You gotta hear this, man, you're gonna love this. We're gonna put up a tent on the outskirts of town and we're gonna fill it with depressed animals <laughs> walking slow. Did I say walking? I meant trudging. <laughs> trudging counterclockwise in an oval. And while they do it, we're gonna play creepy calliope music over them. <laughs> Just this echoey boo doo 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 their spirits broken. <laughs> no connection to the wild. <laughs> like, ah, uh, um, sorry, you said this is for like families and kids? Because this sounds really grim and creepy. Well, you didn't let me finish. Because we're also gonna have men in bright clothing and makeup. Up, oh, time out. You mean like, like transvestites, right? Well, Technically, yes, but they're gonna keep going so that they're clowns. You realize a clown is just a transvestite that doesn't stop. <laughs> like if you, like if you, if you saw a guy in lipstick and eyeshadow, you'd be like, Timmy, leave him alone, that's his own thing. And the guy's like, oh no, hang on. <laughs> like, oh, Timmy, get he's a wonderful clown, get over there. I didn't know you'd use a whole tube of lipstick on one cheek, please. Entertain my child. <laughs> Run at him out of the darkness. He'll love it. <laughs> and every animal in the circus openly doesn't want to be there or wants to murder you. <laughs> every single one. When was that a plus for audiences to see things entertain them against their will? Like, yeah, we went to the moor last night. We saw Patton Oswalt. He was okay, but like, you, you could tell he wanted to be up there. I hate that. I like it when my performers are chased out on stage by a guy with a chair and a starter pistol, and then they have to stand in place under a cage, and they just glare at me and just yell. That's the best thing. Like, I've seen Elton John in concert five times. C minus. What I'd like to see... What I want to see, I'd love to see him get chased out to his piano by a guy with a bullwhip. But right before he goes on stage, if he could take a huge dump right off stage, I, I don't want to see it, but I'd love to vaguely smell it throughout the entire show. Then he gets chased out to his piano and does every one of his songs just screaming them at me. And then as he finishes each one, he tries to run away and they chase him out again. So the whole concert, and the whole concert is like, how wonderful life is with you in the world. <laughs> Daniel is traveling tonight on a plane. That's the magic of the circus.
Got some ambient waiting back in the room. Woo, party! That's the one drug I could see becoming very addicted to. I gotta be really careful. Ambient is amazing. Because it puts you to sleep, which is fine. But the amazing thing about Ambien is that half hour before you go to sleep. If anyone's ever taken it, you know that as you're falling asleep, I don't know what it is in that drug. It feels like you are about to get the most glorious flu that anyone's ever gotten. Not in a gross, sick way. That kind of flu that comes from the exhaustion that is brought on by crushing all your enemies, achieving all your goals, setting the world right, knowing your legacy is secure. You're like, I can just lay in this bed and just fade. Oh, this is awesome. I won! Like, it gives you this... If they, I mean, God, God forbid they ever invent a suicide pill because if they can invent a pill that convinces you as you're dying that you're the, like, my, my legacy is secure! And then the next day at the Burger King, we need another manager. I don't know what I'm gonna do. <laughs> he, he killed himself last night. He's terrible. <laughs> but the thing about Ambien is you have the most, like, I, the dreams you have on Ambien, and they're not nightmares, but they're so creepy and nonsensical and bizarre. Do you know what I'm talking about? The, the weird Ambien dreams that you get? I, here's what I think happens is, I think when you fall asleep, <clears throat> you enter this vestibule, and there's about a dozen doors, and every night, one door opens, and, a, and one, one dream theater troupe comes tumbling out. <laughs> the nightmare group comes out. Oh, it's the clown with chainsaws for tits. Hello, we'll be your nightmare. <laughs> or it's the having sex with someone famous. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Scarlett Johansson. Here we go. Or, it's the naked at school dream, or it's the, you know, I've I gotta go take this test that I haven't studied for. All those classic ones. You take Ambien, go in the vestibule, all the doors open up. <laughs> and all the groups come out and they're like, I thought he was having a nightmare. What the hell? <laughs> Is he on Ambien again? <laughs> Idiot. All right, you know what? Fuck it. Put Scarlett Johansson's face on the chainsaw titted clown. <laughs> and he'll be on a plane that's crashing and it's late for a calculus test. <laughs> and he's naked, he's naked. Do the whole thing. <laughs> My second favorite Christmas memory of all time <laughs> happened in Los Angeles. Los Angeles at Christmas time is beautiful. It is beautiful. You know why? Everybody leaves. The city just empties out. There's no traffic, it's quiet. It's like I am legend, but you can get a sandwich. It's <laughs> perfect. It was Christmas Eve, 1996. And what movie had just opened up? Jerry Maguire. Yeah, 1996. My brother and I are drinking at a bar off of Hollywood Boulevard. Eight o'clock rolls around, we are wasted. And I, my brother goes, hey, we ought to should go see a movie. And I say, capital ID, old sport vomit. <laughs> so we go down the street to see Jerry Maguire, which was playing at the now closed Galaxy Multiplex, the crappiest theater in LA. Who wants to see a choppy print of Anaconda in a room full of meth addicts popcorn farts? Well, come on down to the galaxy where the glamour of Hollywood gets peed on nightly. So, we see Jerry Maguire's playing. I'm like, I love Cameron Crowe. Matt, let's go see Jerry Maguire. My brother goes, all right. So we go in. It's my brother and I, we're sitting together and then there's eight other people all by themselves. <laughs> They're alone on Christmas Eve. And maybe they were thinking, I'll go see this Tom Cruise movie. Get a little glimmer of hope, a little beacon of optimism for the new year, who knows? So we're watching the movie. I kind of liked it. No, I thought it was pretty good, I liked that movie. My brother, unbeknownst to me, fucking hated it, and I mean, <laughs> He is sitting there 
grinding his molars, didn't make a peep, just sat there, this piece of shit, just didn't, <laughs> didn't say anything to the very end of the movie. There's that final scene when Tom Cruise comes running back to Renee Zellweger. Remember that? He gives that whole beautiful speech about, I wanted to be with my wife and I love you and all this thing. And then she goes, you had me at hello. <laughs> and it's really, now, watch the scene again. In the middle of Tom Cruise's speech, there's this sudden dramatic pull into his face and there's tears in his eyes, and he says, we live in a cynical world. <laughs> and that's when my brother went, fuck you, at the top <laughs> of his life. Oh my God, oh my God. Which, that is such, such a, it was such a horrible, rude thing to yell and I was laughing so hard. I, I could not get the air in to make the sound of laughter. I was, people ask me, what is your favorite comedy of all time? Jerry Maguire, when my brother yells, fuck you at Tom Cruise. It is a 90 minute setup to one punchline. It's like, it's like not jerking off for 10 years and then painting the garage. Oh my God. I'm seeing dead kings! <laughs> you know, I live in Los Angeles, and, and for a long time I was very ambivalent about living in L.A., and, it was just, and I realized it was because of all of my New York friends. They are the ones who put it into my head, oh, you live in this shallow, plastic, sellout town. You gotta, you gotta move to New York. That's where it really happens, man. You gotta move to New York. So last year, I moved to New York. I lived in New York for a month. And now I know why all of my New York friends want me to move there. They want another warm body between them and the constant spray of shit and horror <laughs> that you're just subjected to. And by the way, New York is a great place to visit. Don't get me wrong. But you live there full time. It turns your skull into a cage and your brain into a rat and the city is just a stick poking the rat all day. And you, you literally, you get to the point where you're like, I want someone to be sad, and I want to know that I'm responsible! <laughs> so, and I made the mistake of bringing my dog with me. I have this little French bulldog, and he's always waiting, going, eat! And, but we live in the suburbs, it's quiet. He goes on walks, he's calm, he poos, he pees, he's happy. Now he's in New York, every eight seconds. And fuck you, bang! <laughs> he thinks he's gonna be murdered every eight seconds. <laughs> he wants to stop and square his paws and get his ears back against his... I understand that he's descended from gray wolves. All dogs are descended from gray wolves. He wants to die like a proud hunter. I get that. <laughs> Let me die with my fangs out, man. He wouldn't poo and pee on his walks. I know why. He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to die taking a dump on Bleecker Street, like a like a curled up salad bar shrimp. Ooh. So he was miserable. I was miserable. I'm like, what am I going to do? He's my little guy. So my solution was, I found near my apartment this access tunnel down into the subway. It was just this horrible, grime covered, just filth tunnel, but you would go in it and it was relatively quiet compared to the rest of the city. And my dog could calm down and do his business. And he was pooping on stratified decades of filth. I mean, his, his poop was the cleanest thing in the tunnel, basically. <laughs> and I would pick it up and take it away. <laughs> I wanted to walk down the street with his poo going, social contract, assholes! So, it's my last night there. I know I'm leaving the next day. I'm so happy. Oh, boy, this is great. Let's take him out for his poo. We go down in the tunnel. My dog is circling, pick, picking a spot to, to poop on the decomposing characters from Gangs of New York. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I'm just like, come on, man. Come on, do it. And he's just circling, and I look up 10 feet away, are two crackheads. One of the crackheads is on his knees 
about to blow the other crackhead. <laughs> Whose cock and balls are out! Cock and balls are out! <sighs> I assume this is being done in exchange for crack. Goods and services are trading hands. Our free market economy is strong. I immediately look away. Oh, I don't want to see this. Oh, God, no, I don't want to see this. Come on, buddy, do it! My dog starts to poop. And that's when I hear from 10 feet away, nice. <laughs> really nice. I want to go, oh, I'm sorry, am I ruining this? romantic George Gershwin moment in, in the summer twilight of Manhattan. Which, I, I, wait, I said none of that, by the way. I just kept my head down. Please finish, please! He finished, I picked up his poo, I fled. In my head, I'm thinking, I've got to get out of this hellhole city. I hate it here so much! But then I realized, me and my dog were part of that crackhead's conversation later on about his horrible night out. He's like, I got to get the hell out of this city. You're not going to listen to this shit. So earlier, me and Blue Nipples go down the 50th Street grime tunnel, right? He's going to give me one of his patented dry-tongued four-tooth blowjobs for what he thinks is a Ziploc bag. Yeah, crap, I don't know what I done. I cut up a bar of ivory soap because nothing feels better than cheating my only friend out of fellatio, right? Yeah, so uh, I have fun. So anyway... I'm as hard as a towel rack, and some recently showered, well-dressed asshole and his small, well-behaved dog come down the goddamn grime tunnel. The dog starts taking a dump not 10 feet from where I am. I go half soft, I dribble my chemically poisoned cum all over the kids I stole off that blind black kid. I gotta get the fuck out of this city. It robs you of your goddamn humanity. Thank you, Seattle! Thank you so much! Thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh, man. Thank you. Good night! Thank you so much. You're all gonna be on Showtime. Thank you, you guys were such an awesome audience. I, I had no, I, just, I don't know what to say. You blew me away. I'm gonna tweet the shit out of this. Thank you all so much.